Dataversity. I'd like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, the Chief Data Officer's Agenda, moderated each month by Dataversity founder and CEO Tony Shaw. This month, Tony will be joined by guest speaker, Sue Sagudis, to discuss the need for information governance controls. Just a couple of points to get things started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag CDOVision. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. It is my pleasure to introduce to you and turn over the webinar to Dataversity founder and CEO Tony Shaw. Tony is responsible for the business strategy of the company and its subsidiaries, including Dataversity.net, SemanticWeb.com, and Wilshire Conferences, all of which conduct educational conferences, training, and publishing activities focused on the era of enterprise data management. Prior to founding Dataversity, he also started a dot-com in the identity identity management space called Big ID, and was the president of Technology Transfer Institute, TTI. He still facilitates TTI's strategic technology forum for CTOs called TTI Vanguard. And with that, I will turn over the webinar to Tony to introduce today's topic and speaker. Hello and welcome. Thanks, Shannon. Appreciate it. Um, and hello, everybody. Uh, please be with you. Uh, we changed the schedule on the CDO agenda webinars. For those of you who may be wondering, we were previously running sessions on the first Tuesday of every month, but we have shifted to the first Thursday from the date forward. Uh, we've also shifted our subject matter over the past uh, couple and upcoming couple of uh, presentations. Um, uh, we're covering information governance Today, our next session is on data quality and what the CDO needs to know about data quality, and that session will be by Danette McGillivray on September the 4th. So uh, we'll be covering a wide variety of topics over the course of the year in the sessions, um, and this happens to be the, the direction for the next couple. So I hope you can join us for those. I'm pleased to have with us Steve Gudis today. Steve is the CEO and President of Meta Governance. And I think it's fair to say that Steve may shake up your classic notions of data governance a bit today. Uh, through his leadership, his company is implementing a new paradigm in information governance that puts into practice the applied technology necessary in a regulated world. And he's seeing regulation through governance processes and controls. He's uh, an experienced entrepreneur and consultant, and he has considerable experience consulting to major organizations around the world, uh, with some emphasis in the financial services arena, but certainly in areas like oil and gas and computing hard software as well. Among Steve's clients uh, in the past are companies like Standard Oil, uh, BP, C and IBM in, in the in the computer space, uh, Goldman Sachs, and seven of the twelve federal home banks in the financial services area. So, brings a rich history, of experience, and practical perspective to this week's presentation. Please hand us off today to Steve Zagudis. Welcome, Steve. Hi, Tony. So here we're going to talk about information governance controls. And I'm going to go over several different topics here. Uh, at any point, please ask questions uh, throughout the presentation. Tony told me he'd help moderate those. Afterwards, if you want to continue the conversation, just send me an email or something. I'd be happy to expand on some of the ideas because there's quite a bit of material to cover here. But into this, I just kind of want to expand on what Tony said. For the past 15 years, I have been focused on governance in finance long before governance was even uh, talked about from a data governance perspective, really the goal was to audit reports for financial institutions. We're in the world of just automated disclosures against an increased backdrop of, of um, regulatory requirements. It indicated I spent quite a bit of time in petroleum with my years of British Petroleum putting in data governance across Europe, across 12 countries, and really 
we spent some time in health care trying to understand how to help that vertical move forward. Most work has been to come in and, fa and solve issues around failed reporting applications, be it them data warehouses, use of spreadsheets, the fundamental problem that the business just could not trust the data they were using for reporting, and to turn this into a systemic uh, solution to the chronic problem. Quite all my clients came to me because of restatements, uh, regulatory findings, uh, the operational efficiency, just spending so much time having to check the checkers. Right? I'm seeing now that things are coming in more where people are talking to me at the board level, needing to integrate technology into automation of controls. Um, against that, I'm going to go down through some of the trends, and I'm going to go through what in my mind is a progression towards the move of, of information governance. So you see that clearly information is being uh, addressed at the, the corporate asset. Looking at the e emails from American Banker or any of the articles out there, information is going further and further up into the organization. Uh, leaders are requiring tremendous content integrity. This has been true of finance in the past four years. And now healthcare regulators are coming in quite a bit with the uh, Affordable Care Act and some of the changes to HIPAA. You know, out of the world, you've got the ISO standards, um, competitors for efficiency, and as I said, the governance has actually moved up to the boardroom. 10, 15 years ago when I was doing this, I was getting discussions from, from analysts and from data architects, and so that started moving into discussions with the governance professionals, uh, CEOs, and now COOs, COOs, and then moving into the business suite. Right? The problem is that there are just too many overlapping systems. Right? We'll get into some more during this, this uh, discussion today. But business really doesn't know where to get the information from. There are tremendous overlap of systems. A lot of this is because the actual discipline of data architecture and information architecture was really the last of the formal architectures to develop. Uh, why that is the technical architecture and the application architectures were going along, you know, and gaining popularity and development back in the 90s. Well, you know, up through the 90s and early up to even early in the next 10 years ago, data architecture was considered a part of application. Now that has spun out, um, and now information architecture is breaking as is business. What this means is that many of the data systems were created over the past 20 years. The bases and all the tables were pinned at the convenience of expediency and the application movement, as opposed to looking from a, a enterprise-wide view of the content. And that's left a quite a few of inconsistent data repositories, which they're just massive spreadsheets being used to go through and figure out how to do the reporting, make corrections. As we're going to see in a little bit, the, the problem is that what's going out to the regulators just doesn't agree. Right. So a, a simple example, as you know, the problem in organizations is just much worse than this. Um, but we have here three systems, a corporate system, an operational system, and a sales system that are all being used to run the business. The data to the GL for journaling from the subledger to the ledger, it's going to warehouses and it's going to significant amount of spreadsheets that are being used for reporting. Right. And what my clients and when I was working in-house for this, what I would see is when you step back and you look at what went outside the, the bank or the company, was quite different. Um, if you look at what went to a, a tool like a QRM or algorithmics, which are used for forecasting models, that set did not agree with the data set that was used for reporting. So a tremendous amount of discrepancy here. And in the absence of a governance framework, people are left to figure out which one is correct. And often, because of time pressures, they have that luxury. So you end up again with discrepancies. Okay. Uh, what's happening from what I can see in the industry is that model of just use data that was convenient to you, scrubbing it to the best of your ability, and going along with your reporting efforts is no longer acceptable. Uh, because at the top, you've got the increasing oversight, and I just basically have taken some of the key acts that are on the finance and the healthcare side. Uh, battle three is a, 
of, of significant interest to me because Bell 3 basically says you have to have as one of their 14 principles controls at the data layer of the organization to prove that data movement across that organization is accurate. I'm adding into this a little farther, you're going to see that those controls, while critical, are not completely effective in, in providing robust reporting infrastructure. At the same time, because of the volume of data that's been coming out, the, the, the term that keeps being used now, big data, um, is the, the amount of content that is available out there is, is skyrocketing. And the actual true accuracy of the data is decreasing at a point in time when it needs to be increasing to meet industry and regulator speculations. So as Tony said, many years of experience out there, this is what we are seeing. This is, helps explain why that we're seeing the attendance at the data governance conferences are increasing year after year after year because we're starting to realize that the solution to this problem lies outside of their own department and lies at the enterprise level, which is all, all kind of goodness in my mind. Now, one more look at this, this transition across time. In my view, if governance is an emerging discipline, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I see data governance and information governance is different um, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the, the, the significant differences today, but I'd be happy to take the conversation offline with anyone. Um, if we go back as, as the early 1980s, when I just got out of school, this thing called data administration. I didn't even put this on my chart. This is where big companies like BP and Standard Oil, where I worked, had large groups of key edit folks, and their job was to basically edit the key data get into mainframes. Um, and into the mid-90s, this discipline of enterprise data management started to emerge in force. And that discipline has continued through the day. Um, starting about, you know, mid-19, sorry, 2005, you see a real formal definition of data governance coming into the organizations, uh, industry. And data governance conferences like the ones that Data Diversity sponsors really started getting very active, if I remember correctly, in 2007-2008 timeframe. Right. As, as the folks of information and data moved closer and closest to the business, he's now getting companies, some of the big firms are now talking about enterprise information management. Again, I'll over a slide that it starts to hint at some of those differences here. We're dealing with information, and a lot of this came because back in that same time period, the discipline of business architecture or relating everything that we're doing in IT and everything we're doing in the business back to the business through that architecture, you start to see a lot of more, more emphasis going towards the content management as opposed to just raw data. And in my mind, the information governance, that is a discipline you started to see coming in the actual terminology of around 2012 or so. At the two most recent conferences I attended, there was quite a bit of discussion about metadata governance. Um, the topic that I was speaking on, it's a very complicated topic because you take metadata, which is complicated in its own right, and then you governance and bring them together. But whatever I see the industry going here, is that organizations are going to realize to really get control of their information, they have control of all the identifiers of that information, all this metadata, and two bubbles in my mind will merge together. Now back to the world of controls, the thing is that manual controls, which were really done outside of a system, moved into spreadsheet controls when tools like Excel back in the 90s became so prevalent strong focus on data controls because of the movement of, of data between systems, I was being requested or on their own was putting in a control that said, I have 1,000 records here, I moved 1,000 records there. As organizations start to realize that what they're really sending to their boards, to their management, to operations, or outside of the company is not raw data, it's direct information. 
um, thing like a transmission out to the SEC of total income for the quarter, you know, that's not a raw data point. That raw data point is, is made from probably thousands to tens of thousands of pieces of data that get together in a tool like a Cognos or, or an SAP or a strategy or a click view. It doesn't matter the tool. But the key here is that there is a, a mapping layer but what, what we see on the back end, sorry, on the front end, to what the computer sees on the back end, and the controls that we're going to be talking about have to factor in mapping because the income, total income, total sales, whatever you know, attribute you want to talk about, they're derived, and they're quite often derived through the reporting layer. So in the case, just tracking the fact that you moved thousand rows from point A to point B is not going to protect you in making certain that total income from two departments is the same. So this is the, the reporting layer of control that I, I start to see merging, and this is where I'm going to get into from an information governance control framework. I'm just going to briefly talk about my definition of data governance and information governance. Uh, what we're seeing at the most recent DGIQ conference, there was a board posted where we're, we're putting up their definitions of data governance, and, it, and the university sent out a summary that if you don't have it, it's really interesting to look at. Because those definitions were literally all over the place and to what people believe data governance to be. Right? And the, at some point, when you start looking at, at how this relates to your own organization, there's a lot of useful information in that list. So really, to me, data governance is an intersection of data and context. And the focus is very much on data. It's on, on big data, unstructured data, you know, data domains, data models, databases, set tables and columns. And the sense that is in play is focused on making certain that data is as accurate as that data can be. And there are procedures, policies in place that look at, at what happens when it's not accurate. This really is getting into the, the fundamental definitions of stewardship that is out there. And on the tenth side, what I start to see that on the data governance side, you've got an awful lot of finance, accounting, and operational units and reporting people at the table, right? Starting to get into the values of KPIs, they're getting into domain values, they're starting to get into the areas of the success factors that run the business, and they're starting to look at metadata, primarily metadata as it relates to the data architecture, okay? So they, a significant advancement from what we had even been 15 years ago when people were trying to get their arms around this thing called data and data quality. So the industry has moved to a formal discipline, and I think the term that is most used is the stewardship framework of, of protecting and protecting the data. Take this one step forward. You should look at information governance. In my mind, is really starting to blow up this balloon. I had some mentors that were extremely instrumental in my uh, early career years, and they made it crystal clear that when I was talking about data or information, I need to be certain what I was talking about. Um, from a business and an operational perspective, I could not use those terms as synonyms and get away with it for long. Probably why the one reason is I'm so sensitized to the fact that when I'm dealing with derived information coming out of a business objects repository, dealing with raw data. I'm dealing with data. Right? So move this raw data assets and you look at these as something that's produced or available for consumption of business operations. I spent many years working in the petroleum industry when I first came out of school. And analogies that were given to me was that the standard oil at the time had tennis assets of raw crude oil. And crude oil was totally useless to me who wanted to drive my car across town. They had to be refined into something that I, I could consume. And that, that metaphor really worked for me on data versus information, where the data was the raw asset and information became gasoline that I could 
you consume. As you get this raw data and you put it into the business context, of course, information is created. This is what I see now, particularly at the senior level, at the board level, where your interest is. You start dealing with security, you start dealing with reputational risk, you're dealing with disclosure. In my, in my mind, you've moved up to the information layer. And information governance then becomes the control and oversight of these assets. A gentleman by the name of D. Hock. Um, D. was the, the person who invented Visa back, I believe, in the early 1970s. I saw him speak at the Noetic Science Conference in the 1980s, and he gave a really fascinating description about the difference between data and information. And then he went on to knowledge, wisdom, and further. Um, if anyone's interested in hierarchy similar to Maslow's work on data, D. Hock's uh, study is quite fascinating. The umbrella blows up considerably, and I want to point out some of the big differences here. So on the slide, what is shaded is really what was on the old data governance slide, and what is black is, is areas that, that when I go talk to companies that have formalized data governance, they're starting to bring these into discussion. Now, when you start looking at, first of all, let's talk about the context. Um, the world now of finance, accounting, and disclosure as any, because now we're looking at decision support, we're looking at the need for digital signatures, we're looking at the whole risk factor here, uh, the capability of automation without losing control or integrity, now, transparency of information, all right, so the context, this information could be reports, it could be websites. It could be anything that's coming out of raw data assets or external sources. The important part here is who's showing up to the table on the governance front. So we go it was primarily operational units. Um, quite often my, my phone calls are either directly or indirectly because legal is getting involved, security is getting involved, um, data security, information security. You're also audit involved. Um, it's really moving into the idea of a regulatory and a reputational oversight of every piece of content that that organization has or sets out for, for purposes of business or disclosure. Uh, the idea that it was just primary operational units and financial units trying to be efficient. IV discovery and information governance is becoming very important to folks that are dealing with SEC inquiry or any legal inquiry. Um, up at Wall Street Banks, I worked uh, recently, the idea was that there was a retention period for data. The period had to extend to any report or any email or any some that contained that data. That retention period was over, that data was gone. There was a legal reason to have it have retained. So the idea of retention, both you know, not too long, not too short, became put a governance umbrella. And you can see the whole content piece is expanding. So media, um, derived information, websites, user applications, the real source of the information, this started to expand. And I said I'd be happy to entertain. Uh, discussion offline on the differences if anyone is interested. Uh, so if you step back and you want to say what really is one of the major things to have effective information governance program do we need? Well, we need a fundamental understanding of the source and use of information across the enterprise. One that I'm continually amazed by when I start an initiative with a company is they really don't have a good idea, even within the same department, where it's coming from, where it should be coming from, or where it's actually going to be accurate. So the idea of system of record, one of my colleagues that works for one of the large banks really clearly articulated the concept of a provisioning point which sure was any place that I could get data or information from. 
in our discussions, we said the system of record, there needs to be one, only one system of record for a class of data. And then the visioning points are places where you can get that from. And I do have a few slides to expand on that a little bit. But the key is there needs to be a shared model in people's heads of what that is, not the mystery that goes on. Um, talk very briefly, because uh, there are many presentations out that are available on this, but I'm talking about key information governance terms. Uh, from a meta governance perspective, I've actually changed these because at one point, I talked about information owners as the ones that were the subject matter experts and really the knowledge base of the, the content. And the stewards that had a, a responsibility to protect that information through a separation of duty. And to realize that by introducing another term, steward and owner, which are used as synonyms across so many discussions, I was confusing things. So basically, Basically, said information steward or information owner, whatever works for your company, is really the subject matter expert and the ones that have ultimate accountability and responsibility for the content. Step back, and I and a person is coming in and they're dealing with an SEC restatement. There is clear accountability that that could be assigned as to why did we get in the statement the way that we were. Now, it could be just because there was a different interpretation of an regulation. This happens quite often. A company interpret it one way, and we see we'll make a change that say, no, that's not our interpretation. Um, the home loan banks where I worked had this problem in 2005, where they back and restate many years of uh, debt just because the SEC clar clarified an interpretation of all over a shortcut statement or treatment, excuse me. So it's not always a data problem, but quite often the, the restatements are due to data errors. Right. The whole idea of delegate, when you get into a separation of duty issue within a company, and I can speak mostly on finance, where because of a, a protection of the company, an auditor or a management team will say, this department can no longer maintain data after transaction has gone to a certain point in time. So as an example, in, in loans, once the loan has been funded, the customer services can no longer change the loan data. It has to be changed by accounting because the company realizes just way too many errors in customer service getting the loans correct after the fact that are trickling down to accounting. Here's the term delegate here that basically customer service in this case is delegating that responsibility off. Um, the customer is clear, people that are using that information, and the custodian also is clear, those who are responsible for protecting it. If, if it's a production system, that custodian is going to be IT. If it's a user application, that custodian is going to likely be the business. Um, information governance, it's important to standardize sub areas of data, all these classes of data. A recent bank that I was working at had 20,000 discrete pieces of data because of synonyms in the systems and the spreadsheets. That's down to 100, 150 plus classes of data. So this is done at the class level. And you can see as an example, trade loan adjustable rate loans, the blue, blue are people that are using it. The, the stewards, um, you've got delegates in there, and you've got custodians. So to be able to step back and present this type of view to a working group or a management committee opens up tremendous dialogue as to say, I had no idea your department used adjustable rate loans. Why are you using that data? Where are you getting it from? Uh, this is a, one of the values of going through this exercise of being able to capture this and you know, the aha moments come in when you have that dialogue. Right, just moving forward. Let's give you a, a, an example here of the need for these controls. In this example, I've got three applications. I've got a loan system, an underwriting system, and a GL. Uh, and, and so this is always much more complicated than three, but I'm just trying to keep this straightforward. Those systems have three underlying databases, loan, credit, and GL. And the loan system has a data, well, through its own data warehouse, Credit system has its own data warehouse. 
and more along the way so that people could see both loans and credits together created an enterprise data warehouse. I mean, when you know these what, what happens time and time again with warehouses. And because the data wasn't accurate in the warehouse, there were adjustments being made. We know it breaks the rule, but it happens. And annual adjustments were being made in the spreadsheet was being extracted both from the GL and from the data warehouse. So the question here is always, where's the system of record? Um, that needs to be clarified. And because that red box, uh, enterprise data warehouse and accounting, I can see the system of record is not the loan system or the credit system. That whole point of control has shifted to those other systems. Here, just as an example, I'm trying to show department use. So credit accounting and treasury get it from loans. Credit risk complaints get it from credit. Sales and audit get it from the warehouse. And accounting uses the, their spreadsheets for the data. So accounting gets the data both from the loan system and from the now, there so I have been working in this field for 20 plus years, and I've never seen something other than this. This is the norm. Okay. Back, and you say, okay, how do we know these things are all in balance? Right. Well, the is without going through the detail, is that the systems that walked in and talked about, they're nothing more than loan count or record counts. So I have 100 records in the loan database. I have 100 records in the loan data warehouse. In the clients, there was absolutely nothing to just tell me that those records were the same. So the manual adjustment in the loan, that manual adjustment may or may not have made its way to the warehouse, depending on whether there were triggers in that loan database. But I had 1,000 records on both. So this is a scenario of totally ineffective control. What's wrong with the picture? Well, first of all, you got departments are pulling data from different systems. It's inconsistent because of manual updates. Departments different views depending on where they pull the data from. The systems are not validating content, all record counts. Some of the controls in the example, to no controls at all from these flows. Right? And this is going to result in reports and disclosures is being inconsistent across the enterprise. Right. This is really why the, the fundamental root cause of the slides I started with, that you get different answers coming out the back. So I'm giving you some, some very uh, experiences as to one of the primary reasons. Okay. How can you look at the data warehouse initiatives that have gone on for the past 20 years um, there is a popular conception of automated reporting that data sources go into a warehouse and they go out the back end, or they go to operational units. Um, I call this the misconception of data reporting. And the reality is that when people have spent so much time and so much money and so much effort in the data warehouse, nobody wants to talk about what they have to do between the warehouse and the ultimate use of that information. Um, when you step back and you look at the flow of the information across the company, their extracts being come up, coming out of sources and the warehouse, and those extracts are being manipulated by very well-meaning people who are trying to get their reports accurate. Right. I'll give you an example of why this happens uh, time and time again. In, in the world of transactions, there are things called retroactive adjustments. An active adjustment, let's say this is August 7th, if I realize that I'm closing live business and there was a loan to a customer for $50 million that should have been $500 million, loan on July 15th, I'm going to go back and I'm going to fix the system. And hopefully my system will allow me to backdate it back to July 15th if I think to do that. The worst case scenario is I put that loan, that difference, that $450,000 into August business. 
uh, what happens is I put it in July business, but the accrued interest doesn't roll forward correctly. So because accounting knows that, they fix it in the spreadsheet. Right. The other folks that are using it out of the data warehouse and the loan system have incorrect data. Again, time and time again, I see this. So stuff just not, does not agree. Um, now, the is, what do we do about it? Okay. This is a, a diagram that a colleague gave me to explain the current state of what we're doing about it. They, our American banker last week that basically said our processes have become so complicated we have checkers, check checkers. I forget Bank was talking about that, and this is not sustainable. Um, exactly what's happening is that you're getting into operating accounting and marketing, all checking the same data against what source they're using, and then regulators and auditors checking to make certain that everything is valid, and they got another team which are looking in on behalf of executive management, just trying to verify that the information flow coming their direction is consistent. Um, made that 20 to 25 percent of a data worker's time is spent collecting and validating data in order to do his or her job. Um, and see that as a significant operational efficiency. I mean, lean thinking in, in the manufacturing world, and that term is MUDA or waste, that if you can strip out of the information manufacturing process, you become more efficient. So it's a reconciliation control framework is needed to break the cycle in waste. Um, I've been interested, really fascinated by this for many, many years. And, you know, about five years ago, I just grabbed the uh, trail on that term because I thought it was such an interesting concept of a framework for reconciliation control. Right. Now, back and I look at our picture here, going into detail, what you need to see is not, not that the loans are accurate, sorry, not that the rows are accurate, you need something to give you the proverbial warm fuzzies that the data is accurate. So as an example, on the first one, loan database to loan data warehouse, don't just tell me I have a thousand records. Go in there and tell me that my accrued interest and my outstanding principal from a loan loan basis agree with those systems. Right? What this is doing is, is giving me the, the control basal demands but it's also giving me the manual controls that the departments, particularly accounting, are doing on their own. So why not automate that process and share those results with all the stakeholders, which are identified as consumers, and you can start to see the value of, of coming to this kind of content level verification. Right? And keep in mind that some of these, these controls may require math. As an example, if one system has a dirty price, which the no finance means it includes accrued interest as well as the balance. And another system has a, an accrued interest amount, and the other system has an outstanding balance amount. You have to add the two, two attributes, creating a derived information item in the system to be able to bounce back to the other. So this is, is quite often never a one to one comparison. Um, control framework. The idea here is that you have a triangulation that takes place between the ledgers across the transactional systems. And if you step back and think about it, uh, there would be A to A to A to A because that data is duplicated across so many systems. So an example here, the loan system and the credit system have consistently both would have member information. Right, so that's an A to A scenario to the degree. So from some derived characteristic or even a member to member ID comparison between traditional systems is part of the framework that's not really shown on this diagram. The thief is confirming that the subledger agrees with the reporting engines, which is you know, just called proverbial data warehouse. So in the case, you're coming through and saying, can you give evidence that the data warehouse is an accurate reflection of the sum of all of the information that exists in the transactional systems? Right. 
in order to automate reporting, some CFOs that I've worked with demanded this level of control. Interestingly enough, when you automate a report, you take away an accounting work paper. And then the accountants or anyone that's reconciling reports for internally or a regulator have produced evidence the report is accurate. They produce more spreadsheets to, they call them work papers, that give evidence that what they did was accurate. Again, that's more based, more more redundancy and more potential for risk. So the generation of a sub to a warehouse control was mandatory before they would hit the button to transmit out to the external entity. Right. Likewise, the comparison of A to B to the, the sub ledger, in case the loan system to the data warehouse that is, is being performed by counting to the penny and many different departments who typically reconcile their work back to the balance sheet of the company to make certain that they have the complete portfolio of business to their level of tolerance. The benefit of being able to reconcile that piece. And then the third leg, because quite often you start putting GL balances into a data house. If you think about a report out to the Office of Finance or to the SEC, those are combined raw instrument data and they're aggregates that are coming from a general ledger. So to audit that report, you need both transactional aggregates and GL aggregates in a warehouse. The key here is an information framework that triangulates all the copies that I'm told to you as the governance administrator discussion with the stakeholders of where they get information from where, from you know, what systems, what spreads, and what they care about. Uh, let me ask you just for a minute because we have a question here. Um, uh, read in the Q and A section at the bottom right. But Chris is asking, what methods or tools can you use to document and communicate how data might be filtered and managed as it comes out of the data warehouse and into various reports? So we're not seeing that question, Tony. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, the, the, the key here is that the tools that are being used, so just look at the slide that's, that's present right now. There are a whole variety of data movement tools that are out there, and if the call wants to send me an email, I'd be happy to expand on them. I don't want to go into vendors here. But the whole class of data movement tools, and if you look at, at the Gartner or the Forrester discussion of data governance tools, most of them really were data movement tools. Right. So they're looking at the the intersystem point to point transfer. Now that's fine for these dark blue arrows, and you know those tools will tell you where that data came from, and because of Basil, they will show you where you need to put the uh, emphasis on where to plug them in. Again, system to system. These red arrows become a little more difficult. So the first red arrow. Is coming directly out of the data warehouse. So let's just assume that we're using Cognos, um, which I believe is, is an Oracle product. I don't remember anymore. They keep changing ownership. Um, but it might be an Oracle product. In Cognos, when you plug Cognos into the system, you are using what's called a framework. Um, with SAP, it's called a universe. If your data movement tool isn't tapping that, that framework, which is called semantic layer, it's not going to know these aggregates of total loans, which are in loop boxes at the bottom, right? So the tools that look at the physical data structure through an ODBC connection will not get the fact that the data is being taken out by some other tool it loses that visibility. The fact that you've got data coming into a spreadsheet and the fact that you've got data being keyed into a spreadsheet, that lineage is also extremely difficult to have. And if you look at the, the end point, which is the right arrow of the reports coming down, this really is what I get into from an information governance control perspective. You need to look at the end state of the results. And that end state has to be factored into any of your controls. Right? 
that is right. That is the point that many of these data movement, data confidentiality controls or quality controls fall apart because factoring in those red arrows. So, I mean, the shorter answer here is there are a whole series of of technical tools out there that will monitor the data movement across blue arrows. Um, the forward or the Gartner reports on ETL or data governance tools will give the, the question a sort of call or that, that information. Um, there are a few tools that will cover the red, and I really don't know of any off the top of my head um, that will protect the group, which is why you need to factor the controls into the actual output. But by the most part, unless you've got a tool that can read those reports, using the same tool you're using to render the output. So in business objects, as an example, you need to use business objects for your governance controls. Uh, so why did okay. some insight? And again, uh, hopefully, yeah. hopefully, hopefully, yes. Um, if it didn't, maybe I can connect you with the question afterwards. Um, I know you have three or four slides to go here, Steve, so um, I'll defer the other questions being asked until afterwards. Uh, just for the record, before we move on, uh, Cognos was a, a tool purchased by IBM as opposed oh, to Oracle. Thank yeah. you. My, yeah. my bad. I tracked, Tony. Um, You're forgiven. <laughs> so, to look at this idea, and, the, and the, the point here is integrating this control framework right into the flow of information. On the right, I'm showing external stakeholders. That could easily have been a feed to QRM or that could easily have been a feedback to operations. But through the flow of information, putting this control framework right in the middle of that thing is going to result in significant increases in efficiency and reduction. Right. This is what I'm trying to get into here, that because of what we're doing, there are gains in operational efficiency. So as I said, if 20 plus percent of time is spent collecting and validating data, you imagine the value of a corporation of being the, the fundamental governance awareness of the source, use, current systems of record, and known provisioning points for any class of data. Right. That basically minimizes or eliminates where do I get it from. You know, if you've got an effective reporting layer that they don't have to take it to a spreadsheet to take it directly, that's even more efficiency. You eliminate the redundant checking between systems, you're getting even more operational efficiency. So, and these, you know, these can be quantified, and these can actually go into testing efforts or go into other areas where people are saying, is this the same? Like my data quality tool can easily hop a system and check a value at the data layer, but not at the not at the generated information layer quite often. The other piece is the, the reduction in risk. As I said, many of my clients uh, for many years have been in finance. Healthcare these days is more interested in operational efficiency because the world has been turned upside down by the, the changes in the healthcare industry. Um, what we see now in healthcare is that because of the the risk around lack of redundant payment, if unless they can prove a procedure was not done past 30 days, there's going to be a lot of uh, risk to income that needs to be factored through governance. But the ability to have business decisions that are, are fundamentally sound and, and basically not have to look over your shoulder for audits for statements. Uh, matter requiring attention, findings, whatever you call it, um, and being able to get into regulatory reputation risk reduction. This is a, a byproduct that any companies get into governance to be able to solve. Right? Find a, a co cohesive framework that works in conjunction with IT, the business, and the information layer of a company that is in line with operational flow of information is really the answer here. Okay, that's like I got. Uh, well, Steve, we have uh, three or four questions here, which I'm going to try to put to a, um, a meaningful 
sequence. We have a couple from Richard. I'm going to start with what I, I think might be the easier one of these. Yes, Tony. Um, I do think that someone is saying the audio went out. Just have um, you okay, Steve? I can hear you fine. Hear you fine. Okay, I think I think uh, some of that occurs uh, on an individual basis. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the question is, where do you document the owner of the control? Um, where are the controls, the frequency and the requirements for all controls in one place? So the answer to that question is with uh, a governance piece of software. Um, and so the key here is that you're looking at at, at the, the, the company through classes of information, right? And the classes of information are then looked at from who's using them, that's the consumer, who's the owner or steward, depending on your term, who's the delegate, so that's one group. So that needs to be stored as a metadata relationship, and, and then offline I, I could give callers some tables, layouts that will do that. Uh, as well, presentation I gave you one of the most recent conferences. Uh, now I want to say for that subject area, what are the few key data points that will give the the consumers you know, warm feeling if it's accurate? For my example on the slide, let's say we're talking about loans. Well, loan count, the fact that the right member for each loan the total accrued interest and the total of outstanding principal, those are my critical critical key, key role objects, as I would call them. Okay. And I'm going to associate those as an attribute in the metadata table directly with the subject area. Right. And I'm going to associate in that as an attribute in that metadata table the department who has approved the controls Department, if it's other than the data steward or owner, depending on your term, who related controls, and more very important piece, I'm going to also have a flag that the consumers have approved the controls also. So procedural piece that's often missed, that it's not just the owner that has to approve the control. The, the information governance working group has to facilitate feedback from all the consumers that they are in agreement this will support their business need. If you do that, then what you end up with is ineffective controls at the, at the educational level. And one of the another distinctions that you're going to capture again as a metadata attribute of the control is tolerance level at the organizational level. Because I am running a hundred billion dollar portfolio into a modeling tool, my tip level for loans may be one percent. If I am within one percent of well one hundred million, I'm not enough. Right. So show me a red control and send off a bunch of alarms if within an acceptable tolerance level, let me know there's a problem, which in my world will be a yellow control. But it keeps it to the penny. I mean, they balance the penny. That's that's how you do gap standard. So tolerance is if it's off the penny. So again, at the you think about a subject area and a meta model of of subject areas. Pardon the pun there. Uh, the attributes of that table will include the control points needed for the control, who's approved it, and the tolerance levels for those control points. Right. Um, let me see. The the next question we'll take here um, is is a relatively straightforward answer. Um, so Derek's asking uh, that surely knowing that there's a difference is not sufficient, and that you need to know what that difference is, which would mean that you'd need record level comparison. Control works is you're summing up. The, you're setting up the individual components. Let's say I'm comparing the loan system to the general ledger, and I'm fixed rate loans and variable rate loans. I'm summing up the comparison of fixed rate loans and compared to one, two, three in the GL, and 
uh, very great loans to account five, six, seven. That math works. They don't care about row level details. Basically, my, my record's green. If that doesn't work, I and it's a point that I care about it because it's outside of my tolerance for error, I want to see back just the offending rows. So give me back 50,000 rows and make me reconcile. Give me back the three that were out. So you're correct that you, you need real detail for aggregation, but you need to have the row level detail for the sorry, row level detail only for rendering back an error. I think actually you're you're agreeing or acknowledging Derek's point there, and, and um, so we can move on. One of the one of the earlier questions that Richard had asked to uh, was something that I was going to you know, to you also. Um, so it's okay. I get the need for controls, and that these controls um, are automated and very granular. Uh, but you can end up with hundreds of these, if not if not thousands, I would think. Um, one of the things that to me in one of your diagrams is as you know, every additional information element or type is added. I mean, you're you're essentially adding complexity at an exponential rate. So. How do you keep these organized, or how do you govern the control itself so that there's transparency? My version of that question would be, how do you deal with this this great level of complexity or break it down in order to, to simplify the management of it? All right. There's a couple of questions embedded there, and Tony, I'll try to be brief. Um, not my strong suit always. The, the key attributes that you're using to control typically can be found within a company's 10K or 10Q filings, financial measures that the company has to report, or to interest, total outstanding balances. You, you would not use every single or even 20% of the attributes to the cost point would be just overkill. And if the control framework starts generating noise, then they're not going to use it. So we deal with a critical success factor, or a key control object, sorry is a better term. The key control object really has to be meaningful. And for all of the work I've done for many years, I've really never had more than five per your subject area of information. So with five control objects, I can tell you if your entire loan portfolio is accurate across the systems. Okay, that's point number one. The second point here is the goal through information governance is to, to know where people are getting the data from and to steer them away from sources that are known to be inaccurate. So if I have 10 systems that have advanced data, and as, an, as a company, I can agree that I'm not going to use seven of them because they're bad, I'm going to put my controls on top of the three that I've agreed we'll use. Now, often I have to go from 10 to 9 to 8 to 7, et cetera. So as, as I decommission a system or a spreadsheet, I turn that control off. So organize this through subject areas, through the working group, and it really does not get that complicated at that level. Okay. Um, I have uh, 11.58 on my clock. I'm, in, I'm sitting in California. I, I don't know that we have time to deal with the rest of uh, the questions. Um, Benita did ask, I think in reference to your last answer, what's an example of one of these success controls? The um, crude interest, for financial world, it's going to be a crude interest. It's going to be outstanding principal. It's going to be current interest rate. The key of, of a loan to a, a customer in the world of finance, sorry, in the world of health care, total beds, um, advertisement stay rate, um, current uh, payment rate. So it would be whatever, you know, have these folks look in the financial reports of their company, you'll see measures that become part of the MDNA. Um, okay. uh, and I'm hoping, yeah, I'm hoping that that addressed your question too, Gail. So. If not, um, feel free to send me an email at Dataversity. Not, and we'll follow up with Steve afterwards. Steve also 
mentioned a, a um, uh, document for your last presentation that you would include for one of the questions. I think um, we should distribute that to everybody if you're okay with that, because uh, so, okay, I one, think everybody would be interested. The one, the presentation that was given at EDW in April okay. is specifically on this subject. The, the conference was on, on a larger metadata governance. So the June, the April EDW is what would cover this. Okay, so we can we can pull that out. Uh, we're um, going to have to wrap things up there, folks. We're we're right at the hour. Um, I want to make a quick mention again of the uh, of the next webinar in this series on what the CEO needs to know about data quality with Danette McGilvery on September the fourth. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Steve, very much for your presentation with us today, uh, generating the questions that you did. I uh, shall be following up with you shortly. And then uh, I'd like to thank our audience as well for staying with us for the full hour. Shannon, I will hand back to you. Thank you. Tony, and thank you, Steve, for this great presentation. And as always, thanks to our attendees for being so engaged and asking such great questions throughout the presentation. Just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email to everyone with links to the slides and links to the recording within two this day, so for this webinar by end of day Monday. If you don't get to see it in your inbox by end of by Tuesday morning, let me know, and we'll be sure and get you those, those pieces of information. And thanks, everyone. Hope you all have a great day. Great. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye, folks.